Hi, everybody. So this DVD is called Get Real, Integrated Sustainable Solutions. And there's a good reason for that. There's a lot of chatter. I call it the green buzz. And we're going to compare that against true sustainability, where the real sustainable solutions lie. The long lasting, best payback, what's going to get us out of the current state we're in globally is going to be true sustainable solutions. So we're going to start to cut through that. So the, the chatter we're hearing in the coffee shops, banks, everywhere we go, we're seeing green, green, green. Eight years ago, when I would talk about sustainability in my architecture firm, my CEO would look at me like I was green. You know, what's she talking about? Idealistic. It had all these connotations to it. Then four years ago, all of a sudden, he was listening. There was a market. He was catching on. Uh, we formed a sustainability team. Next thing I knew, I was teaching in-house lead courses. We were working on a lead neighborhood development in Dubai with 143 buildings. Who would have thought in the middle of the desert we'd be doing these things? Well, it turns out those were superficial goals that imploded. Right next door to that, we have Abu Dhabi. Mazdar City is going to be the first net zero city, and they're really going to do it. This is an example of the difference. They planned ahead. They're using an integrated approach and it's sincere intention behind it. And there's going to be huge results from it. And they're attracting the best commerce in the world, the best minds of the world, to partake in this project and have long lasting results. So what we're getting to is this superficial green washing that's happening. We've all heard this term. I call it green buzz. Green washing is a more typical way to say it. And you really see it in the exhibit halls at like the AIA convention, things like that. You know, once again, a little timeline. You know, five years ago, I would say half the floor in the exhibit hall said, you know, we have a green product, you want to see it, and you know, you go and have a conversation. A couple years ago, it was, you know, 75%. This year, everybody. So this is what I want to create out of this room, and anybody that sees this DVD, is a smart consumer that knows what questions to ask, because that's going to drive the true market transformation. If we get away with too much of this greenwashing, it's really going to ruin the integrity of what needs to happen in this sustainable movement that's going to get us out of this. So when you're hearing, you know, oh, we have recycled product. Well, you know, what standard did you use to verify that recycled content? What percent of your product? Is it 1%? Is it 20? You have to know what questions to ask. And that's the big picture. That's why we have CPAs in this room. We have students. We have contractors. We have architects. We have computer engineers. We have everything across the board in just even this classroom. It's because it affects all of us. And we need to all know how to speak this language. So when you think of sustainability, what connotations do you have? What's a, a first word, first thought that pops into your mind? Sensible, survival, keeping alive. Great. You're talking about like the people that survived the depression. My grandma can make anything out of what I think is nothing. There is no such thing as trash or waste. It's something she can reuse and recreate. And that's really what we're talking about, being smart with our resources. Being sustainable is about using things within our means, not cutting down more of a force that can't recreate itself, using our resources in terms of energy and water as efficiently as possible, and just really it's a mental paradigm shift. And that is what we need to see a change. So it's not just a set of this perfect menu of choices of green building, and that's going to solve everything. It's really a mental shift where we're looking at it for its social qualities. This is a more livable city. We're talking about equity. We're talking about a good, strong middle class. We're talking about people working together and creating jobs for this. We're talking about the environment, of course. We depend on the environment. Gross domestic product doesn't mean much if you don't have the resources to make those products. And then, of course, economics. You know, that's what we end up with. That is the bottom line. But there's no longer this traditional bottom line. 
what I just described right there is the triple bottom line. And that's what we're going to talk about more today. So that's the green mo movement. It's everything. It's everybody. We're all in this together. It's not elitist. It's everybody. And cut through the labels. Don't believe everything you hear. So we're going to get smart, get real. Let's get into it. So did I make my point? Green is not just a trend. But this is a great example of a project that integrates all these educational kind of landmarks within the building. It's kind of a building of exploration. So it's talking about how the building is living and functioning. This is how the building breathes. This is how it gives back. This is what this product is made out of. This is how much energy we're saving. This is how much energy we're producing and how. And so people start gaining awareness and engaging in their environment. We haven't been looking around. We just need to open our eyes. We're going to put this in the context of LEAD today because this is really the national framework for how green building is being conducted. And that's really what it is. It's a framework. It's a starting point. It's a way to think, checks and balances. And because it is national, you can go anywhere in the country and be speaking the same language when you're talking about how much energy you're saving, how much water. Well, against what baseline? LEAD has that all prescriptive for you so people understand what it means when you're LEAD certified, LEAD silver, achieve LEAD platinum. That really means something through this third party verification. So what does it mean? We're using the word. It's not LEADS. There's no S at the end. Leadership in energy and environmental design. Sensible building. Pamela put this beautifully. That's really what it's about, making sensible choices, not being wasteful, not being careless in the way you do things. So efficiently using energy, water, land, your resources on that land in the best way possible. You could get the same results, just think in a different way. And there's a lot of synergies between those things we'll talk about in the next chapter. Protecting occupant health. This is a big one. And this is why schools are so important. We finally took a look at it. Some of our oldest, more decrepit buildings are the schools where children are developing and absorbing these toxins and things in these buildings that were built just with pretty much cost in mind and getting things done as quickly as possible. And when you're developing, kids are very susceptible to this. And improving employee productivity. Here's the social side of thing working with the economic side. So that two sides of the triple bottom line, depending on each other. They're interrelated. And they're actually getting real numbers about this. You have a well daylit building, good natural ventilation, not CO2 making you feel dizzy after eight hours. You're going to have more productive people. You're going to have less sick days. And the employers are going to benefit from this. There's a real business case. The social side is not a fluffy side anymore. There is a metric behind it. People are really looking at this as a real component of the equation. Reducing waste and pollution. This is a big one. Waste can get reduced just by thinking differently. Waste for food for another product. That is often the case. Companies such as Nike are looking at this as a huge business opportunity. Government initiatives. EcoReal, we are working on a few federal projects right now, and the GSA is pushing LEED certification big time because they wanted verification that their sustainable goals were being met. And the great part about this is a lot of these are design, build, and contractors sometimes may fluctuate a little bit from what's in the specs. Well. What LEAD does is it makes you document, it makes you take pictures, it makes you verify where things are coming from. It's, so that's where that checks and balances come in. So they're seeing real results because they chose to make LEAD Silver a baseline for a big chunk of their existing buildings. And they are the biggest per square foot building owners in the US. So this is huge. They're seeing 26% less energy use. Could you imagine the dollars behind that number when we're talking about billions of square feet? Huge. 27% higher levels of satisfaction. So this is done through like surveys. They're asking people, 
How do you feel in these buildings? Are you happier? Are you functioning better? Are you getting more done? What would you change? Much higher levels of satisfaction. And so people will stay. If you're a business owner and you are in one of these lead buildings or a sustainable building that meets those type of standards, then you're going to keep people around longer. You're going to attract better people because people are starting to be aware that these spaces are better for working and living in. 33% less emissions. And that's that CO2 we're talking about. Up to 16% increase in worker productivity. Once again, hitting that bottom line. And people are producing more because they're happier there. So lead makes a green is what that totals up to. So return on investment. Once again, I think these numbers are a little out of date. I think they're a little low. But about 7% building value goes up almost 8%, occupancy ratio goes up about 3%, rent ratio as well. To a developer, this is everything. Especially right now, we're in Portland right now, and we're seeing a lot of empty buildings. Many developers have done lead for existing buildings or some initiative to be more sustainable in their buildings and make that recognized are sounding off about those two things and how much it has saved them in this economic crisis. So that's why sustainability is not going away. There is a big payback for this. Operating costs go way down. So there's more cost savings. So the costs are green. This is the first thing we have to address when we're talking to our clients. And really, we become almost financial planners in our way for their real estate investments to look at it in a different way during the whole life cycle of the building. But even before that, Davis Langdon is the most well known for his analysis of green building, green building versus conventional building, comparing those costs between the same types of buildings. And what he found after hundreds of buildings being assessed across the country, different regions, different climate zones, different scales, there are expensive green buildings and expensive conventional buildings. And it was all across the board. And this wasn't because the expensive buildings were laboratories and you know some of the cheaper ones were offices. He took LEED certified silver, gold, platinum laboratories versus conventional laboratories. And within the same type, within the same scale, we were seeing that there was a variation, not just because of lead certification, but just in general, how the project was done. When you look at the lead scorecard, which you guys got in your handouts today, if that's looked at holistically, there's huge savings there. If it's a point game, you're going to end up spending money. There's the difference in my eyes. So certification of green building was not a big predictor of how much a building was going to cost. This is California. They have a sustainable building task force. This was actually quite a few years ago, but they were seeing the problems in their state very early on. And so they said, well, what, what are the real numbers? We know this is probably a good idea, but nothing's going to change until we see the real numbers. And that's very true. Even when you're dealing one-on-one -on -one with a client or a team, you have to see the numbers. So they did a very large assessment of the buildings in California. But net present value. So that's pretty much saying, what are your present inputs and outputs, and where do you end up? And for energy value, this is looking at a 20-year net present value, over $5, emission value $1, water value 50 cents, waste value. They put a value on everything, including the social side of things, productivity and health value for both certified and silver, being kind of the baseline cases of lead certification, and then the higher goals of gold and platinum, being quite a bit higher. So $55, this is per square foot. So less green cost premium, which was $4 per square foot. At the end of that, we have a total 20-year net present value for certified silver bu buildings being about $50. And for gold and platinum, that higher level of certification, almost $70 per square foot. That's a huge positive. But you have to look at that 20-year net present value to really know your investment. It's like investing in anything. 
You want to diversify your portfolio. You want to invest in something that's going to be long-term payback. It's the same type of thought with a building. Diversify your strategies. Get more bang from your buck from finding synergies within them. It's, it's really applying that thought process we've done in other areas to buildings. It's not new. It's not recreating the wheel. So the long-term savings is coming from that reduced energy and water, even storm water, waste. These all come with bills. They all come with costs. So energy savings typically covers any cost premium you had to pay for those systems. Lower operations and maintenance costs. So that's the ongoing upkeep of the building. Very important to consider. Facility managers are key in this equation. And the occupants being more aware are key as well and how they engage in the building. But one thing they know, healthier, more productive. At least they feel it. Sustainable business. So there's a couple key terms we need to know. And that's life cycle analysis and life cycle costing. So life cycle analysis is looking at the environmental impacts of the building over the whole life cycle of the products and systems within the building. So you want to be as environmentally benign as possible. Least amount of waste in the end, last the longest, and create the least demand in how you operate the building and the upkeep it requires in terms of water being used, energy being used, and just maintaining the building operations itself. Life cycle costing, just like it sounds like, you're looking at the cost. Over the life of the building though, not just up front, that's the change we're gonna see when we talk about integrated project delivery. And that's, you're not just looking at upfront costs and value engineering out anything that costs a little bit more. You're taking the long term into account. So operations, maintenance, cost savings, all taken into account over the life cycle of the building. So as I said, they're a long term investment. Buildings are a long term investment. There are artifacts. They used to be regarded as such. We used to build buildings that were meant to last. The infrastructure that was built 60 years ago is still the infrastructure we're using today. And even prior to that, that's what's lasting. We lost something along the way that we need to get back. And realizing that everything we're putting on this earth, the resources it takes, we need to be more considerate about it. We need to be smarter about it. So the type of questions you'll ask as you're going through this process. How much insulation is needed to decrease duct size? That's a pretty typical one, but not traditionally. It sounds simple, but you know, it's kind of a contractor talking to a mechanical engineer, talking to an architect. And this doesn't always happen, unfortunately. And you know, I've talked to contractors recently about things like this, because if you stay in your little bubble, you don't know what you don't know. And I talked about the point of diminishing return for a question like that. It's like, oh yeah. We have these architects saying, you know, let's go up to R50 walls and, you know, all of a sudden we will have the most efficient building possible. He's saying, eh, after R34, we're not really seeing anything. You know, there's a point of diminishing return. You know, it's a waste after that. And, you know, that was his opinion. But he's looking at his buildings that he built and looking at the results. So we need to be listening to each other, you know, maybe taking that into consideration. And how quickly can those upfront costs get recovered? So life cycle cost analysis, we describe the definition of that. This would be the type of question that would come with that. And this is all about questioning things. Products, your building, your process. Is the high efficiency, high efficiency HVAC unit, which costs 20% more, going to save us money over the long run? That's life cycle cost analysis. How much money is it going to save? Life cycle assessment. Is the more efficient HVAC unit better for the environment over the long run? So we're talking about CO2 emissions and our resources. And our grid. Our grid is getting strained. Our electrical grid is uh, pretty ancient at this point. We need to start looking at our electricity and the load we're putting into it differently. So the new economic model. I said triple bottom line very early on. And this is what it is, the kind of catchphrase 
we like to use in our business at Eco Real is people, planet, profit. P's are catchy, easy to remember. So people, community, livability, a vibrant community. You look at the Pearl District, great model of it. There's a reason that Portland got put on the map. And that's really because we created this vibrant community out of what was an industrial area. It was, you know, where the trains were unloading, shipping yards is where the next development's gonna be. And we are experts at making those developments a vibrant place, something that used to be just desolate. Homer Williams is our champion in starting that, and I hope that it continues. But Portland needs to keep moving. We can't get too comfortable in that that was enough. Planet, ecological integrity, profit, economic prosperity. These things all lean on each other. They all depend on each other. You can't just focus on the economics and think that it's just gonna happen because you're focusing on the economics. We need a strong community. We need an environment to back up these products, these businesses. People have to be buying the products. People have to be able to support themselves. There have to be resources to support these things. It's all interconnected. And really what that comes down to is sustainability and equity, which is something we hold near and dear to our heart too with our work with Owami.